Great. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tarun Mathur, and I am the Chief Technology Officer for Indigene. And I'm delighted to be back at the Digital Summit presenting to you, albeit virtually. So today, in keeping with the Future Ready theme, I want to talk about some very recent developments in the AI and machine learning space, things that have occurred in the past 12 months or so that have had a pretty significant impact on the way we see AI and ML will be utilized in our space. And a lot of us are going through digital transformations and that digital transformation is being fueled by innovations in AI and ML. So I thought it's worth taking a little bit of time to look at what sort of breakthroughs have happened in the past year that may be something that we have to be ready for over the coming year or two years. So it, just keeping ready with that future ready theme. So I'll put together some uh, slides. If um, all we'll do is I'll quickly share the slides on the screen and we'll uh, look at the Great. A, um, just a simple outline for this presentation. Uh, so we'll start off, we'll talk about some broad trend lines that we're seeing in the industry. And uh, these seem to be intersecting with the technology innovations, and these are likely to yield some uh, some big results for us. And right now I'm going to be focusing on certain areas of our life sciences space. We're obviously a broad industry, so we're going to look at three major AI developments that uh, we think have direct impact in the way that um, we do business in our um, in our business units. And then lastly, I'll, I'll talk about how these innovations and breakthrough have changed the way that we at Indigene are actually making our investments in R&D and technology. So I just want to show in real life how these things are actually impacting things on the ground. So just a level set, there's some terminology that we use regularly that we need to get comfortable with. Um, I've put just four of the key buzzwords on the screen here. Two of these are ones that I think most of us are, are pretty familiar with or hear quite regularly. The first two, so artificial intelligence. Uh, the, the definition of artificial intelligence is something that uh, it gets uh, debated and um, there's you know, arguments among academics about it. But broadly speaking, artificial intelligence is literally that, simulating cognitive tasks, you know, thinking, reasoning. And it tends to be a generic term that um, is, is a superset for machine learning. Uh, a lot of us think about artificial intelligence and think about uh, general artificial intelligence where you actually have computers that are reasoning and behaving and thinking and acting on, on tasks the same way uh, humans do. We're not quite there yet. The industry doesn't have that technology. We're not really prepared with, with general artificial intelligence, though a lot of work and effort has been going in that direction. And some of the recent technology innovations start to look and smell a bit like general AI, but it's not general AI. It's, this is, these are still machine learning tasks. And machine learning, on the other hand, is really uh, mathematical algorithms. These are formulas, these are algorithms. They're typically used to classify and predict, and they work using data. So they, normally they use some, sort of, some form of pattern recognition, and they tend to be more specialized. So these are uh, algorithms that are designed to solve tasks or tasks. Um, they're not general in nature. You, you, you use algorithms, you develop machine learning models to solve specific tasks. So these are two terms I think we've, we commonly use in the space, but it's important to level set on these. The other two terms on the screen, maybe some are not as familiar with. The, the first one is human in the loop. And this is a, a common phrase that's used to describe a, an operational model about how we actually deploy and use machine learning in practice. In the human in the loop model, human experts behave as subject matter experts to the machine algorithms. And so what that means is that these algorithms, these are learning algorithms. So human experts will curate the data, they'll annotate data, they'll feed data to the machine so the machine's models can get either built or refined or improved. So uh, you have a workflow system that is driven by machines. However, uh, data may flow through human experts and they will annotate or correct the output of the machines and feed it back to the machine. That's something called reinforcement learning. And you have other approaches when you're developing the models to begin with, your subject matter experts will start to curate the training data that's actually used to build the model. Both are considered human in the loop. The other phrase is machine in the loop, and it's kind of the converse of that. Some people call this intelligence augmentation, but machine in the loop is 
is where you have a fundamentally human expert or subject matter expert driven process and these algorithms um, help to accelerate or optimize that. So think of an AI assistant within your your um, word processor or other tools online. So these are um, machine learning models that are embedded into systems that are fundamentally driven by human experts. So these are just uh, a few of the key terms level said, we'll use them uh, throughout this uh, the rest of the presentation. So first, a couple of key trend lines, and these are things that we've observed and have been participating in um, with many of you who are at the, uh, the summit today. Uh, number one is we've seen a substantial increase in enterprise adoption of machine learning technologies and AI and machine learning technologies. And um, when I say increasing adoption, this is something that goes beyond just setting up pilots and experiments. What we've seen, especially this past year, is that more and more of our clients are going beyond the pilot phase. They're actually rolling out fairly sophisticated machine learning based solutions into business critical applications. And uh, what that means is a couple of things. One is certainly um, the risk adverse nature and uh, how these things are, are managed both from a cost perspective and from a deployment perspective, those all come into play. You're, you're talking about a very different scenario. Uh, but also, um, and very importantly, the metrics that we use to measure the success of these programs have shifted. So in the past, when we do AI and machine learning models, especially in these experiments or pilot programs or um, you know, small scale uh, concepts that we do POCs, we, what you would typically measure are things such as uh, F1 score or you know, accuracy or other, other measures that are typically used to uh, evaluate the performance of a machine learning model. Now we're shifting things towards business metrics. We actually have our, our, our industry, a lot of folks are now moving towards, am I getting the business impact, the ROI, uh, the financial ROI, the, the productivity ROI, uh, quality ROI out of the solutions at the, um, the enterprise scale. So it's a very different set of metrics, a different set of eyes looking at these solutions. And we've seen this greatly accelerate over the past year. We've also seen a increase in human in the loop workforces. And what that means is that we now are seeing more and more um, of, our, of our clients and, and peers set up their operations in a way that are really optimized for a human in the loop workforce. So how we actually structure the operations, how we run them, um, um, even the resources involved, um, all of those have transformed and changed and that's um, a lot of it has to do to support these human in the loop uh, workflows. And then um, lastly, another big change, especially in this past year, we've seen a huge trend in new ways to adopt machine learning models into our businesses. So these are not just the algorithms, not just the formulas, but actually the pragmatic implementation of these. How do they actually work within business? There are new options on how to consume these, and, and, and that comes from two directions. Number one is a lot of us are now better prepared to adopt AI initiatives than we ever had before. And what that means is we're more data ready. Uh, most of our of our um, uh, larger clients and, and more digital uh, transform clients have, have taken initiatives where they've made their enterprise data available through different means. So whether it's through a complete restructuring of the enterprise data lake or setting up APIs uh, to get the data how data is aggregated, um, new data science teams. Uh, that's, you know, we've seen more and more of that in place, uh, a lot more awareness of what enterprise data really means and how to use it. And there's also been a shift in the policies, how auditing is done of the uh, compliance and data security elements. Uh, a lot of these machine learning initiatives are cloud-based. And so how do we reconcile the data privacy needs and data security needs of having um, sensitive enterprise data pushed to the cloud in order to use these machine learning models, we're seeing more and more enterprises figure that out and be ready with that. At the same time, we're seeing more and more availability of models that are more easy to be consumed than they have been before. We're going to talk more about that in the presentation, that the way we can actually consume and use machine learning models and what models are actually available to us have made a, a, a dramatic shift, especially in the past year, year and a half. So it's worth highlighting that the pace of innovation in AI has also just 
shot up dramatically. As a matter of fact, um, when we develop new models or new algorithms, one of the things we, we like to have are some sort of benchmark or uh, mechanism to evaluate the performance of them. And what you see on the screen right now, this is a screenshot from a, um, a benchmark for natural language processing called GLUE. Actually, in this case, it's called SuperGLUE. And what this is, is a, um, it's a suite of tests and tasks that are run against natural language processing models, and they're used to compare the different models against each other. And it, there was, uh, GLUE was uh, General Language Understanding Evaluation, that's what it stands for. And um, this was a suite of tests that was created, and then a year, it, it became obsolete after one year. SuperGLUE, which is a more comprehensive and complex test, has, has been out about a, around a year. And in the screenshot, you can see that the, um, the scores here are already exceeding the benchmark that's been established for human performance. So the red box there represents, um, if we were to run these tests with human subject matter experts, I'm sure you know, roughly 90 uh, is the score, and we're already starting to see um, multiple natural language uh, processing algorithms exceed the human benchmark. And so already these benchmark tests are becoming obsolete. So one thing that we see happening, uh, is already happening this year, we, we'll see more of that over the next couple of years, is a rethinking and reconstruction of the benchmarks that we actually use to evaluate the different algorithms that are out there. So let's dive into some of the technologies and especially what we've seen in the past year that may impact the way that we do uh, business. And by business, I'm talking about what we do with the technology to change the way we, we do our digital initiatives and our digital transformation. Uh, there are three areas that we want to talk about. Number one is something called large language models. This was perhaps the, um, the biggest news items in the AI space uh, last year. Uh, secondly is the growing importance and impact of explainable and something called interpretable AI. We'll talk about that. And then uh, lastly, we're going to talk about pre-trained models and how we actually use them because this changes the way that we actually can consume certain types of machine learning technologies. So first up, uh, large language models. So first of all, what is a language model? So a language model is it's an algorithm, it's a model that is used to figure out the next word after a sequence of words. So you give it a phrase of text and the model will come back to you with what the following text, you know, word or words would be after that. You know, that's kind of a simplest explanation of it. In reality, what it really does is provide a probability distribution of here's the uh, corpus of words that, that could follow and then the probability of those different words actually being the next one. Now, that's on the surface, it sounds pretty simple, but that capability unlocks a lot of different use cases. And what we see listed here in point number two are some of the, uh, the use cases that are commonly used with these language models. So question and answer systems are um, probably one of the, the more common one, including uh, chatbot type of uh, applications. Uh, search engines use them. Uh, machine translation is completely changed using these large language models compared to uh, prior techniques. Uh, summarization of text, so you give it a, a, a larger document or a paragraph of text and it'll come back with the summary with the salient points in there. Um, the ability to pull out and extract information or to classify information contained within some text there. Um, we've seen a lot of very creative applications of uh, these uh, large language models. Uh, it's used uh, by folks to create news articles. We've heard about fake news stories and some of the, the more sophisticated large language models and their the risks and impact attached to that. Um, recently, there's been some uh, experiments where they're actually using these systems to code, right? to write software. And so you give it requirements and natural text and it will come back with code. And OpenAI has done something, I think Google has also put together some experiments in that space. So there's a wide variety of different use cases. And in fact, researchers today are, are experimenting with these models and finding new ways to use them as well. Last year, one of the biggest news stories was around the OpenAI initiative uh, called GPT-3. So this was um, published, I think it was around May of last year, and then available um, as beta APIs in, in, in the July timeframe, if I'm not mistaken. And this was um, newsworthy because it, we're, we saw a significant increase in the complexity and size 
of the language model. So uh, prior to GPT-3, we had GPT-2, which was about 1.5 billion parameters. And, and parameters are basically um, mathematical weights that are used in the algorithm. So if you're familiar with um, your linear algebra type equations, you have a lot of coefficients. These, these numbers, those are weights and parameters are synonyms for weights. And so 1.5 billion, which was a big number when, when GPT-2 was there, and um, then you know, about a year later, all of a sudden, here's GPT-3 with 100 times that. 175 billion parameters are used in that, that model. And so this you know, made the press and all kinds of um, speculation around what this means and are we getting closer to general AI. So there's a lot of hype around what this can do. It, it is a, a huge transformation, but it, it, the way it actually impacts the real life and the, what we can actually do with it in um, in a production setting, especially in our in our industry, um, we need to be realistic about it. We'll talk more about um, how what the um, impact is on large language models like this. And by the way, it wasn't just GPT three. Last year saw other uh, examples of large language models. In, Nvidia had put out a, um, a pretty sophisticated model, and of course Microsoft had uh, Turing NLG, which is another um, very large model. So these these uh, large language models are based on an algorithm known as transformers, and, and transformers are a, um, a technology that was introduced in roughly, I think it was 2017, that um, is, represents really, um, it was, was actually created to solve natural language processing uh, tasks, and even today represents the state of the art in natural language processing um, algorithms. So we've seen a variety of applications of transformers. These ones are the big newsworthy ones, and especially um, what OpenAI did last year um, made the, the, the biggest impact in the press. But generally speaking, the utilization of transformers and, and um, what they can do for us has uh, had a, a significant impact on uh, technology companies who are, who are trying to build and implement machine learning based activities. So this, these uh, 175 billion parameters uh, that certainly is a is a big number, and um, a lot of research has gone into seeing what you know what's the impact when you go to that that large of a number. How do things change? And some surprising outcomes have come out of it. And what we've seen is that the pace now of innovation, especially in natural language processing, has um, continued to accelerate. As a matter of fact, we expect. I wouldn't be surprised. If somebody announced a one trillion parameter. Uh, model and there's even rumors of a 10 trillion parameter model coming out, which is it, it, interesting and and it'll be very very curious to see what kind of an impact it has and how machines simulate reasoning and thinking with with natural language. Uh, but while this has been happening, um, there's been also teams of folks looking at well, uh, it's it's good and fine to have these very large models, you know, based on these huge number of parameters, but can we achieve similar outcomes using smaller numbers of parameters, right? So that we take some of the lessons learned from these large models and see if we can't uh, come up with smaller models. And there has been some promising work in that space. Uh, we've seen uh, a couple of uh, companies demonstrate uh, language models that have maybe a tenth of the parameters with uh, performance coming close to what we've seen with these large language ones. They have other constraints, but um, at least that, that work is being done. And that's important because the, the larger the number of parameters, as you can guess, the complexity and the compute and the cost involved in training them is significant. We don't really know how much OpenAI spent to train the, um, the large language model, but uh, what I've read is that so they're estimating roughly a, a dollar for every thousand parameters. So if, if you have 175 billion parameters, you can you know, do the math. And that, that's not an insignificant number at all. So. So these, this field, especially the large language models, were the number one area of impact in the um, uh, last year, at least press-worthy AI news. Um, there are some limitations. So as, as uh, researchers and uh, other folks have been experimenting with these models, we've been learning more about what they can and cannot do and some of the um, issues involved. Uh, in this case, you know, if we look at using these large language models to generate content, and that's one of the first things we looked at was that can can these large language models be used to reliably construct uh, freeform text and um, responses to questions that are a little more um, uh, 
natural and human-like in nature, there have been issues around the messaging that comes back. So biases, racial um, uh, biases, for example, the tone, the language, consistency. So there are issues. There are um, times when you see randomness, uh, in a sense, come out from the, the system. And the, these models also have um, issues around the coherence over larger blocks of text. So the way that these transformers work is that uh, you, you provide a prompt or some sort of seed content into the system, and then it makes the, the predictions um, after that. However, that window of text that you supply, the amount of content you can use in that prompt is kind of limited. So you, around 500 to 1,000 um, uh, words is probably the max, I think, um, that you can put into these models. And so that means that there are limitations on what these systems can do in creating longer prose or longer text. So, um, so we have seen limitations here with these models, but that said, the, uh, the use cases that do come out of them, that do work well, are, are impressive, and the ability to adopt these systems is actually much easier than we've seen in the past. One of the issues, and not just here with these um, transformer models, these large language models, but generally speaking in the ML space, and especially when we talk about deep learning, which are these more complex layered models, these are black boxes for most folks. And, and more and more, and especially in a regulated space like what we operate in, this idea of having a black box that um, we, re we really can't explain what the output of the system is, that is an issue. And uh, it's becoming more and more important for us, especially as we make that shift from pilot and experiments into production, it's more and more important for us to actually be able to explain the decisions and the outputs that these models make. And that's called explainability of the, the machine learning models. And that's something that has also seen an impact and has seen a change in the past year. So we'll talk about that. So deep learning models, machine learning models, um, they're normally opaque in nature, right? They're, like I said, they're black boxes. We don't really know what's happening under the hood. Um, but we operating in the space that we do, we find there are many instances where we do need to understand what's happening. We do need to explain how the model made its decision. And there's two general approaches towards accomplishing this. Uh, the first one is called explainable AI, and this is the one that is probably the, the leader among these two. And what explainable AI is, is basically a tool or a model that explains how another model made its decision. So something that's usually done post hoc. You have a, you know, like for example, the transformers we just talked about, you would have those models in place and then explainable AI tool sets would actually use a variety of data and constraint and will will try to create a an explanation for how that model reaches or reached its uh, decisions. And um, it doesn't actually um, inspect the model. It basically uses a variety of data sets, inputs and outputs to create a, a, um, a visualization, if you will, of how that particular model works. So it's a model built to explain another model. Now, this is the, the field though where we see the most um, common application of explainable AI. So if you're undertaking a machine learning initiative, especially one that's dealing with sensitive data and, and you want to think about explainable AI, you'll look at these tool sets. Um, and there's, there's a variety of them out there. Um, in the natural language processing space, there's a few, I don't, Google launched one, something called Lit, and, and there's a few others that are out there. And what, what you get out of them is basically a, it looks like a heat map or um, um, basically a, a linkage map that shows how different inputs are correlated to different outputs. They tend to be interactive, so you can click on different nodes and see how different decision pathways are done. The second approach to this is something called interpretable AI. And this is a field where the model itself is designed and built from the beginning to be explainable or interpretable. So the model itself explains how its decisions are made. So think of a flow chart or a complex um, decision tree that you can actually trace and follow, and that is used to construct the model. And so it certainly is um, more desirable, and you can think of this as the white box as compared to the black box that we, we see in explainable AI. The challenge is that, um, especially for technology companies, 
a, a white box is harder to commercialize, right? You, most folks aren't terribly interested in, in revealing all the nuances of their, their models and algorithms. So we definitely see a lot more being done in the explainable AI space as compared to the interpretable AI. So as part of being future ready, one thing that, that we recommend, and um, especially if we're talking about digital transformation in a space where you are dealing with sensitive data and you are thinking about these explainable AI concerns is actually having resources and the tools to create these explainable models and to understand how to navigate these the maps that, that come out of those tools that, um, that generate explainable AI models. The third major trend line or point that we've seen in the um, in the past year has been the growing utility of pre-trained models. And what this means, and the, the, um, the large language models we talked about earlier is a very good example of that, but more and more we're seeing the availability of models where you don't have to go through the exercise of creating training data in an exhaustive uh, exercise of, of tuning and, um, and building large data sets to actually train these models and testing them. And this is a huge shift since in the past year. In fact, prior digital summits, I spent time talking about how you actually curate data or the, how you actually do feature reduction and the data sets involved between, that are in, in the process for training machine learning models, supervised learning. And now, um, especially with some of the breakthroughs in the past year, the necessity or requirement to do that isn't isn't uniform. You'll, you'll have a lot of use cases where we don't have to go through that exercise and you can consume pre-trained models for your specific tasks. And one of the ways you do that is you, you take a pre-trained model, especially one of these large uh, language models, for example, and you can tailor it for your business purpose, your task, without actually having going through an exhaustive training process. And this is something called meta-learning. And in meta-learning, we have um, three terms that are commonly used, and those are here, zero shot, one shot, and few shot. And what that means is that uh, I can take a pre-trained model, uh, let's say you know, GPT-3, for example, or one of these other um, large models, and using a very small set of data, I can then tailor that model to give me to, to solve the task that I have at hand. And zero shot means that I just use the model out of the box. I don't give it any new data. One shot means I just give it one sample and few shot means I give uh, just a few samples. And this is, this is fairly interesting and we've seen some surprising results with these large models that are uh, with large pre-trained models where we can actually just take a few examples of what I'm looking for. So some, think of a task that that particular model has never done before. Maybe it's classifying some content um, against a taxonomy that you have internally within your own business. So in the commercial marketing space, uh, we have digital assets, we have detail aids, uh, websites, ad banners, and you may have a taxonomy of information that you want to classify content with. Um, that taxonomy is something that certainly a large language model would not know out of the box, but using few shot learning, you may be able to actually get really high fidelity uh, results out of the system. Uh, with just taking in maybe a dozen examples as training. In the past, you would need hundreds or thousands. And um, and we know this firsthand. So um, Indigen has been in the space of doing uh, classification of, of content for a few years. And when we built the first model using uh, traditional supervised learning techniques, what we found is that we, it, it took over 30,000 assets in order to just get the initial baseline results. Today, we're over, well over 100,000 assets into that model. And here, you know, we can take a pre-trained model and just take a few examples and achieve very high quality results out of this. And this is an exciting way of doing um, machine learning and consuming machine learning model. And we think um, over the next couple of years, you're going to see growing uh, number of, of um, pre-trained models that you can consume within the enterprise. We also have a... Um, uh, a growing marketplace of pre-trained models. So uh, I think a lot of uh, investments have been made by prominent technology companies um, to create AI as a platform, as a service, and, and they recognize that uh, we want to focus and, and optimize these models for our specific business tasks. So we're seeing more and more examples of pre-trained models that you can directly consume in the business and you don't have to go through extensive 
data training and data science exercises in order to, to start using them in, in very useful ways. And the last point I'll mention on this um, in the, the pre-trained space is that there's this concept of uh, federated models. And so one of the questions that comes up uh, from time to time is that we do have sensitive data within the organization and um, that data may be used in some form to, uh, to train uh, the models, whether, whether it's through meta-learning or through other more traditional uh, techniques. But the, uh, the willingness to uh, push that data into the cloud um, or, or go through these kind of more um, uh, open federated models of, um, of data sharing, you know, there's some risks around that. So what we've seen are algorithms where the machine learning actually happens on site or locally. And you can think of um, in the consumer space, you can think of machine learning models in your iPhone, for example. So the reinforcement learning and, and I think things like Siri and some of these other AI driven applications work that way where the content is local, it's, it's on your device or it's within your enterprise and there's a locally built machine learning model. When the, the model is constructed, you get a certain weights, we talked about those parameters before, those get pushed up to the cloud and all the other iPhone users or all the other enterprise users who are working with um, you know, similar types of algorithms, their models get pushed to the cloud. So you're not actually releasing any data, you're just releasing the models. That gets aggregated, computed, optimized in the cloud, and then the cloud pushes those refined models back to those devices. So this is a, a federated model where you can still get a, a, a model within your business, your enterprise, that is um, constantly improving, is taking advantage of the expertise and knowledge that comes by sharing information across enterprises without the risks of data leakage. And um, we think we're gonna see more of these type of federated model approaches, um, especially in healthcare and life sciences uh, over the uh, coming couple of years. So um, I'd like to uh, kind of conclude by talking about how these technologies have impacted the way we are making our own investments in, in technology. And then I'll do that by illustrating an actual R&D initiative that's going on right now. So we have within our space, one of the challenges is dealing with commercial content and we develop commercial marketing content uh, globally in a variety of language, a variety of different challenges. And we're always looking for ways on how to make it more effective, how to uh, make it more real time, make it more personalized. And so there are a number of approaches and a lot of us here have been involved in different methods of solving that. And one of the R&D issues we've taken on is, can I take source content, some creative content that's been developed, maybe it's a, a, an original asset, it's agency created asset, and can I create derivative assets out of that? And derivative in the sense that can I create variations of that content appropriate for different audiences can I repurpose that content into new formats or new channels uh, that we, um, we don't have prepared uh, ahead of time? And so these are operations and services that are being done today, right? So we, we have services, we have um, also there's some compelling technology to help accelerate that, but these are, these are being done. However, the question is, given what we just talked about, given what we've seen, especially in the past year with breakthroughs with um, large language models, and uh, pre-trained models and taking the zero shot, one shot or a few shot type of approach. Can I actually have an algorithm do this work without going through extensive training and historical data collection and uh, a lot of the exercises that we typically do today? So what we've kind of looked at is that out of the box, if I was just to take it in a brute force method, we haven't seen great results um, just directly. If I just take a master you know, detail aid and I, and I push it through a language model and, and try to construct um, new examples out of it, we don't get reliable or good results out of it. But the interesting thing is in our space that um, we don't necessarily have to be that uh, direct with the content. Um, while we are creative and we, you know, we create um, content using a lot of best practices, we do tend to be template heavy. And so a lot of the content that gets created in our space there's a lot of rules around that content. There's um, language rules. There's uh, certain layout rules. There are, and certainly um, the templates and um, the rules for those templates, uh, they, they, they tend to be fairly concrete, and well-defined for our space. These aren't just purely 
open-ended pieces of content. So what we're doing in the R&D center is we said, well, what if I take advantage of these constraints? What if I start to recognize that uh, the content we're working with tends to fall into established templates and that we can decompose content by using the knowledge of those templates, using the knowledge of the rules around these, um, uh, this content framework that we use, and use that to help optimize the output of these pre-trained models. So this is something that's ongoing right now, but at least what we found is that uh, the first step of taking and decomposing content into these smaller chunks using these rules, you know, um, that seems to work pretty well. And now what's happening is we're taking a look at these large language models and saying, if I start having it make predictions and classifications of these smaller units of content, can I actually get meaningful output? And so, um, the jury's out still in terms of whether it were, um, this is something that we can actually roll into production, but at least early indicators that we found that there are some use cases, there are some scenarios where we actually get uh, very interesting and promising results. So what we're hoping is that over the next uh, um, 12 months or so, the, uh, the improvements and the uh, commercial availability of these uh, very large language models, combined with uh, some of this work that we're doing with the templates and the frameworks that we operate with, we can actually start to really transform the way that commercial content within our life sciences space, regulated content, is actually generated. And the icing on the cake is if we can do that using an explainable AI model or even an interpretable model of some form, uh, that would be you know all the better. So what we're doing right now in R&D, this has been a, a huge shift for us where we've moved from focusing on doing supervised learning and building fit for purpose applications and models uh, for our clients to solve business problems, now more than ever, we're looking at are there pre-trained models where I can more rapidly create a, a deployment program or a, a digital transformation initiative and get similar results without the, the time, the cost and complexity involved of doing traditional supervised learning. So this is a, an R&D initiative that's going on at Indigene. I know that a lot of our peers and, and, and um, other technology vendors are doing something similar. So I thought I'd, I'd share that here and it's something that um, you, um, hopefully you would be interested in, in keeping a tab on over the next 12 months. So just in summary, um, some of the things we've talked about, uh, what we've seen in the AI ML space that have been driven by some of the innovations of the past year, uh, we're moving past the piloting and POC phase of machine learning into real commercial business critical applications. And this is translated into um, changes in how we measure the success of these programs. It's also put pressure on how we adopt and utilize machine learning. Um, the biggest area of impact last year was uh, certainly around in language, and maybe it's not surprising that um, that was the biggest area of focus. Uh, natural text or natural language is our primary method of communication, and so we'll certainly will it's not surprising that as we think about general AI, we wanna make sure that language comes first. But uh, last year saw a significant breakthrough. We're expecting to see also similar orders of magnitude improvements um, this year and the coming year. If you're looking to uh, take advantage of these uh, new technologies or at least being ready for deploying them in the kind of use cases we talked about, then um, it, look for pre-trained models and look for opportunities where you know, zero shot or actually few shot type of meta learning is possible, you'll actually get very high fidelity results uh, with minimal amount of uh, content that's used to train the system. And then lastly, uh, explainable AI is becoming uh, more and more available to us so we can look at models that, are, um, that can actually explain the behaviors of black box models and we may start to see, you, know, you may find opportunities to have interpretable models where these are the white boxes where they're explainable from the beginning. But um, it, it's not unrealistic to have an expectation that even very large complex models are explainable through the kinds of tools that are becoming available now. So that's what I wanted to, um, to share with you today and um, I'm happy to take any questions uh, that come in um, around this uh, this material or any other, anything else related to AIML where we have some experience. Okay, let me just open up the chat here so I can read these. 
So um, first question is, how much is compliance stifling the growth of AI innovations? Uh, do you see decision engines and regulators working hand in hand to create wide adoption in the future? So, um, so here, certainly compliance, um, I wouldn't say it's stifling the growth, it's, it's, it's added additional uh, constraints for sure, uh, but we do see regulators and um, technology innovators and um, you know, decision engines are collaborating, are working on this, and there's a variety of initiatives at all levels around um, solving that problem. It seems like the debate about whether we need to be using AI and ML, that's, that ship has sailed. I think we're all on board with that. The question is, um, how do we manage the risks attached to it? And um, what we're seeing is that um, a lot of the, the work going into how we regulate these, how we audit them, um, what the compliance requirements really are, the, these are being adapted. So um, what, what we expect to see, and we, and we are starting to see that, is that um, there'll be more and more changes to the regulatory frameworks, to the compliance frameworks that are sensitive to and are aware of how these um, AI and ML gets adopted. Things like explainability and interpretability, those go a long way towards that. So um, so, so the answer to that question, yeah, I, I do see, um, I don't see these things as adversarial in nature. I see them as uh, collaborative and I actually expect to see uh, um, a lot more growth of AI because I think the pace of adapting our requirements, um, the compliance requirements, has been accelerating dramatically. Number two, how does uh, using predictive analytics help pharma companies unlock new sales territory uh, potential? So this, so I'm not necessarily the expert on sales territory um, analytics, but um, what I have seen is that the um, as the uh, compute power and the, um, the type of models that are being made available today are able to take on more feature sets, the variables used in order to make predictive calculations, these have dramatically increased. So um, it's one thing to take standard CRM data you know, and um, being able to drive predictions out of that, but now to, to take CRM data and combine that with publicly available, either with social media or other sources, um, that is actually becoming much easier to do. So I think the ability to um, uh, to create very sophisticated um, predictions in near real time, actually. So because of the the cost of compute reductions that have occurred, the ability to do these things um, at scale with much larger sets of data has has really um, improved a lot. So um, without you know being really an expert on sales territories, but I can say that generally speaking. Uh, prediction models are able to consume much broader sets of data to work much more efficiently, work closer to real time. And so my expectation would be that we can in embed those predictions into more applications uh, far easier. Okay, number three, while the wave of augmenting human intelligence has taken off in the last five years, how do you predict true general intelligence help us move to the next step towards being future-proof? So I my opinion, I think we're a long ways away from true general intelligence. And um, certainly some of the things we, and what we talked about, and especially some of the examples you may read in the press uh, of what people are doing with something like GPT-3 may smell like general intelligence, but they're not. It, it, these, these systems still don't reason or, or think the way that the human mind does. So um, I, I actually don't see a near-term general artificial intelligence type of um, uh, uh, system. Um, but I, uh, certainly research is going on in space and we're trying to understand what it takes to get there. But um, right now, I, I really, when I look at machine learning and AI, I'm far more compelled by uh, human in the loop or machine in the loop type of operations where the machines are there to either accelerate the work that we're doing or um, we have specific tasks that we have the machines assigned to and human experts are there to help optimize it. So, um, so that's that's just my feeling on it. Uh, um, just as a side note, you know, uh, with this large, you know, 175 billion parameter language model, there was a, a company that had conducted a couple of, couple of experiments using GPT-3 in a healthcare setting, in an e-health setting. And what we found is that really, when it came to dealing with humans, especially dealing with patients, there was a long ways to go. Um, yeah, with these systems. And so, for example, the models that we're seeing and the kind of work being done today 
these are trained using text. So um, GPT-3 um, used um, uh, some, uh, actually a couple of different um, sources of text. One was called web crawl, there's a few others, but basically these are mined off the internet. So it's just text flowing in the system. And I think they took in somewhere around, you know, maybe a trillion words into the system. But it is just text. It doesn't have visual data. It doesn't have auditory data. So if you were to apply that algorithm into, let's say, uh, some sort of robot or a point of care system, um, things like reading body language or tone of voice, those aren't in there. And um, there certainly is a lack of empathy systems as well. And how do you that? I think there's still a long ways to go. What are the biggest challenges you see for life sciences to even pilot, not scale some of these technologies? So uh, it depends really on the maturity level of where the organization is at. We, we have some who are uh, moving along on this, this journey and have done the diligence and done the work of being ready for it. And by ready, what I mean is there are certain prerequisites in order to adopt the machine learning models. Number one is a data readiness. Do you have access to enterprise data? Do you have a framework or, or a, a method to actually deploy these things in a business use case? And I, I think there are organizations today who maybe haven't really progressed um, far along that particular journey. And until you have that that data re readiness, and, and by data readiness, it's not just the IT side of things, it's not just having the technology in place, but your policies and procedures within the organization, um, how your resources are actually structured in order to uh, to bring these in, that requires work. And I think that's probably um, one of the biggest barriers to entry for um, some organizations who uh, have not progressed along that maturity model uh, very far. So I think that, that certainly is one. And uh, so when we talk about even piloting, though, and, and, and to be honest, with my own personal experience, what I've seen over the past year is that there's a pretty uh, small number of organizations that aren't ready to really even pilot these programs. Now, identifying what the use cases are, maybe that's the barrier, right? There's the potential and the hype around what AI and ML can do is one thing. The pragmatic reality of what it does is another. So be realistic about where you want to apply machine learning. And I highly recommend don't think of it as some sort of um, bot that sits in the corner and does things all by itself. Think about human in the loop and machine in the loop type of operations and see how you can augment existing operations or how you can have very specific tasks where these models can be built and evaluated for and used. I think if you're able to, to do that, if you're able to say, here are you know the four or five specific use cases or tasks that we think um, the uh, AI could actually implement, uh, be implemented in, that is probably the, the first big step. The next one is making sure your data ready for it, that do you have the necessary data and information in order to uh, configure and use these particular um, technologies. And then lastly, um, set up a, um, your KPIs, your metrics. How do you want to measure success? Are you going to be measuring it based upon technical parameters, you know, ac the accuracy, the um, um, you know, true, uh, false positives and true positives and, and those kinds of scores? Or are you going to look at business metrics? Are you going to be looking at um, would I actually reduce the turnaround time for certain assets or has the uh, cost of operations for particular services reduced? Uh, those are something you also have to decide up front. Okay, I think we are uh, right at time. And uh, thank you again uh, for listening. Uh, uh, certainly if any other questions or you'd like to talk more about these or debate with me about these things, uh, feel free to contact me uh, by email and um, we're happy to engage and, and talk about these topics more. It's an exciting time in the AI ML space. And I think the next 12 months, especially we'll see uh, as significant a jump as we saw in the past year. So thanks again.